Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to the folks over in the power plant at our modern service. Uh, good morning to the folks streaming online as well. Jesus, like many of us, grew up with the Jonah story. Uh, he used it in his ministry to teach and to make a point about God caring for all people, not just the religious folks. And for me, I remember learning the story of Jonah in this tiny Sunday school classroom that had this big felt board with these cut out people that would stick to it. We didn't even have TVs. <laughs> now maybe you, maybe you learned about Jonah from the VeggieTales movie uh, with the anthropomorphic asparagus playing the lead role. Maybe you first encountered it in a picture book or stumbling through the Old Testament you found. Uh, maybe you only know bits and pieces of the story, but you probably know the gist. God calls this prophet Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh with a message. And he nopes his way right out of there and heads towards the town of Tarshish in the opposite direction, as if you could run from God. He finds himself thrown off of a ship and swallowed by a fish. And somehow, he's in that fish's belly, alive, and he prays that God might deliver. And then the whale spits him up on shore and he gets another shot. Now maybe you've thought, this story seems a little fishy. I mean, how can a person live in a sea creature at all? And as wild as that is, I think we'll discover that the fish is nowhere near the wildest part of this tale. And somehow, this enduring story has something to say to us today. Something that may push us enough that we'll be tempted to check out flights for Tarshish. We'll pick up the story this morning after the blowhole blowout, when God has heard Jonah's prayer and he rescued him. We'll meet Jonah on the coast, covered with seawater and whatever else the fish had hacked up with him. <laughs> it's not the best first or second impression, and God speaks. The series we're in, it's called 40. Uh, last week, Joe introduced it so well to us. Uh, in the Bible, the number 40 shows up again and again. And when it's related to time, it's used as a metaphor for a challenging stretch. A time of wilderness, struggle, frustration, and also an intense opportunity for growth and development. When you walk through challenging times, someone might say to you, oh, you're going through a 40 experience. Now, many of us are in our own challenges, challenges we created, challenges that we're a part of just because of the community or people we're around, challenges that have just happened to us. Today, we'll meet two characters in the midst of a 40, and each respond in vastly different ways. And perhaps if we let it, if we listen, this story will challenge us in ways we didn't think it could when we kept it on the kids' shelf. So we're going to dive in, and that's another Jonah water fish pun. Uh, <laughs> one thing I love about Jonah is that it is laugh out loud funny. In fact, the Hebrew text is full of these puns and jokes. So anytime I make a really cheesy dad joke, I just want you to know, I'm being faithful to the Bible. It's okay. <laughs> so turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Jonah, covered in more fish sauce than some Thai curry, knows what happens when God calls you, and he's going to listen this time. The word of the Lord says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation for which I'm going to tell you. Now Nineveh wasn't showing up on anybody's vacation list, especially a prophet of Israel like Jonah. See, Nineveh... That was Israel's boogeyman, the worst of the worst. In the book of Nahum, the city is described as that bloody city full of lies. Tell us how you really feel. So this assignment for Jonah, it's hard. It's scary. It's not at all with people that Jonah would want to be around. It's like if we were sent to ISIS, or maybe to that neighbor who has that political sign that you don't particularly like. Or maybe to that person, you know that person who posts those posts on Facebook that you see all the time, 
do I have to go to them? And notice here also, while God has told Jonah to go, doesn't tell us what the message is. Let's look at verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out. And he said, Get 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. How about that for a sermon? <laughs> Five words. You have 40 days, and then you're done for. Jonah sounds like the life of the party. Nineveh, welcome to this challenging time. You deserve it, and there's nothing you can do about it. Sorry about your luck. This preaching is fascinating to me because this declaration from the prophet doesn't look like anything else we see in any of the prophets. First of all, it's really short, shorter than any other oracle. Second of all, it doesn't give the Ninevites anything to do. It doesn't tell them about hope or some way to respond. It just says, you're out of luck. It seems like a really long way for Jonah to go just to tell people about their inevitable doom. But most importantly, Jonah doesn't use the phrases that prophets always use when they speak for God. See, normally a message would start or finish with something like, thus says the Lord, and Jonah doesn't do that. So I wonder, is it possible that Jonah has maybe edited his message a little bit? Maybe he shortened it some. Maybe made sure it didn't offer any hope or second chances to a people he thought didn't deserve it. I'm convinced that Nineveh, they're not the only people in this story going through a 40 experience. I think Jonah is too. And I think it's one of those self-inflicted challenges. See, because Jonah is straight sour about this message he's been given. And he acts like it. I think that leads him to miss what God is up to, miss what God wants him to do. See, we can send ourselves into a stretch of a 40. See, Nineveh did it in her love for violence and hurting others. She brought the anger of God against her. It's a self-inflicted 40 experience. Jonah, with his disdain for these people and his unwillingness to Trust that God has the best in mind. He's worked himself into this own psychological stretch challenge. And we'll get to see how both respond. Now Jonah's a prophet. He gets to communicate with God, gets to hear from God. And yet he sees it as a negative. In the book of Romans in 8.28, Paul says, We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those are called according to his purpose. But Jonah here seems to think that God doesn't know what God is doing. I mean, I can picture Jonah standing there in the town, bullhorn in hand, you're done for. I hope you had fun, because this is it. Bullhorn drop. So if you heard that message, how would you respond? I'd probably ignore it. I mean, if I got up here and I just preached a five-word sermon, how would you respond? I don't want to know. Please don't answer. <laughs> and this is happening in Nineveh of all places. This could get ugly. So let's see what happens in verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the ashes. This is the most effective five-word sermon in history. Somehow these people, full of lies and blood, turn to God. They fast. They put themselves in sackcloth, this burlapy fabric that showed that you were sorry. They sit in ashes Another sign of asking for forgiveness. Even the king, he follows his people in this change. Look at what he says in verse 7. The king issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, 
by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Now, this is the part of the story where I can't help but laugh. <laughs> See, they're, they're so serious, they put the sackcloth on their animals. Now, I know some of you dress up your dogs. You know who you are. <laughs> but this, this is a whole nother level. I feel so bad for whatever guy had to go dress up the chickens. <laughs> it's crazy, but in Jonah, the animals in this book, the fish, the animals in the fast, later will meet a worm if you read along. They actually obey God better than his prophet. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, don't be outfollowed by the barnyard. <laughs> Good, that's just embarrassing. Don't do that. Okay, let's keep reading what the king had to say. And let the men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Each person rejecting their own violence, their own sin, each person turning to God. Now the king doesn't know if this will work. <laughs> we don't get to know what might get us out of a 40 experience. God isn't some genie or servant that has to do whatever we say. But we can trust what he says about himself, and we can trust that he's good. The king has very little to go on. Jonah didn't offer any hope at all, but, but this outsider king, by the grace of God, gets this glimpse of hope. Who knows? Maybe this God's love and mercy and forgiveness, it's bigger than we could have ever imagined or expected. Who knows? Maybe he'll turn from his anger against us. Now we have all done things, gone places, made the comment we regret. We so often don't listen. We hurt others even in ways we don't know. Like Nineveh, we may have all enjoyed our own power, safety, wealth, sense of importance at the expense of others. In the story of Jonah, we find a way to respond when our failures become clear to us. See, because the Ninevites respond. They turn to God and they stop doing what they were doing. They humble themselves. Even the king takes off his royal robe. He stops pretending like he knows what's going on and he's in control. And they all cry out to God. And let's see what God does in verse 10. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God thought he should rid himself of the Ninevites. Just like last week in our sermon, he thought he should rid himself of the Israelites. But he decides against it again. He lands on the side of compassion. Friends, however big you think God's love is for you and for this world, you have underestimated it severely. You're never too far gone. Never unworthy, always valuable to God. Some of us just might need reminded of that this morning. Because it can be really easy to forget, really easy not to believe it, especially we're in the midst of a challenging time. But however big you think God's love is for you, for the world, you've underestimated it. Now at this point in the story, Maybe you're really excited and happy for Nineveh and you're celebrating with them. Or maybe you're a little annoyed. I mean, that seems way too easy for a city this awful. Why did these people of all people get a second chance? Let's see how Jonah responds. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order for, to forestall all of this, I went to Tarshish 
For I knew that you were gracious and a compassionate God, that you're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and you're one who relents from causing calamity. Now we see Jonah's true motivations from the very beginning. He wasn't scared of Nineveh or its people. He didn't think the call was pointless. He didn't want God to be patient, be forgiving, be compassionate to a people he already were deemed were unworthy. He ran himself into this own psychological 40 experience because he didn't want God to show compassion on his enemies. I relate to that more than I'd like to admit. Maybe you do too. Jonah spits out this phrase, you're gracious, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness or steadfast love. It's a Hebrew phrase for this deep, God-sized kind of love and commitment we can't even comprehend. This is a phrase repeated throughout the scriptures again and again. Last week, when Moses prayed to the Lord, he quoted these same words, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. Abundant and loving kindness. Now Jonah uses it as an insult. The very characteristics that define how great our God is, is used against him. They're used as a jab. And then Jonah adds a little bit to the end of it. I knew that you're one who relents from calamity, turns from your anger, gives second chances. He's observed that about God throughout the story of Israel, throughout his own life. And he's calling God weak. These characteristics that Jonah pleaded to, to get himself out of the fish, these are things that he loves about God when they apply to him, but he hates them when they're applied to his enemy. And this is why the story of Jonah is a comedy. (laughs) That the in-person, the prophet of God who is supposed to get it and have it all together, disobeys again and again and misses it. See, because he cares more about the downfall of his enemies, the security of his people, than the plan of God. He wanted grace, but for himself only. He wanted compassion and understanding, but not for his enemies. And these people of Nineveh, the the worst of the worst, with basically nothing to go on, repent and turn to God. Now, it's easy to point at Jonah and hurl blame at him. But Nineveh really was terrible. It makes sense that he wants justice. He doesn't want his enemy to flourish or be forgiven. He wants fire. And there are probably people we wouldn't mind get hit, getting hit by a meteor either. <laughs> you know it, right? Somebody or some group that popped into your mind that you don't want to see anything positive happen to them. Some people you think are are too far gone already. Or you certainly wouldn't want to walk to their place and have a conversation with. Some of those people you're thinking about might even be in this room. So Jonah hates the Ninevites because they're godless, because their values don't come anywhere near his own, because they represent everything he is against, because they are threatening. And so he wants God to be an executioner, not a rescuer. But God sees their value, because that's who God is. It's easy for us to feel good about ourselves and think that we're right, we've got it all figured out, and everybody else is wrong and beyond help. But followers of Christ, we're called to something bigger, something better, and it's hard. As I was reading, I came across this story of Daryl Davis. He's a black man who had experienced violence and injustice against himself his whole life. He's been beaten and mocked and verbally hurt in ways that I couldn't even understand. And his Christian faith, it led him to start talking to members of the Ku Klux Klan. He actually started befriending them and, and asking them why they thought what they thought. He got to know them as painful as that must have been. Even when one might point out to a verse in the Bible that they would use to justify their thoughts and actions, Davis would ask to read it with them and then read some passages that he loved to them. Davis writes this. I have clan robes given to me voluntarily hanging in my closet. 
These clans members have invited me to their homes for dinner, and some members have quit the clan as a result of getting to know me and respect my non-racist beliefs. Time and exposure is a great healer. Perhaps it's the only healer for irrational fear and hatred. Laws can be made to take people out of the clan, and they should, but laws cannot be made to take the clan mentality out of the people. The best way to learn and respect one another is to know each other. When I read the story of Jonah, I have to wonder, why did God call Jonah of all people? (laughs) Why this prophet who's clearly going to struggle? Couldn't he have spoke to Nineveh in a different way? (laughs) Couldn't he have made another burning bush or or sent a prophet like Amos or Micah or Hosea, somebody who would have behaved a little bit better? Perhaps. Perhaps God calls Jonah to this place because he wanted the Ninevites to see up close someone that they had hurt. Perhaps, perhaps God wanted Jonah to see these people who he hated, who deserved the scorn, up close and personal and then see them turn from their ways. Something that only God could bring about. Daryl Davis, by the leading of God, got up to close with his enemies and change happened. Jonah and the Ninevites get up close and things happen. God needed Jonah to realize that God's love was bigger than just for him. And the only way he could see it is if he went there. God can change the Ninevites. God can change and use former clansmen. God can change and use us. Because God loves you, loves the Ninevites, loves your enemy, and loves Jonah. God's love is Bigger than eight. My friend Austin tweeted this just this week. God loves the person you hate the most more than you love the person you love the most. God is patient with the Ninevites, with us. God isn't even done with Jonah at this point. He's going to go and continue to teach him and push him and guide him. Richard Boyce says it this way. No one could question if the Lord decided to leave Jonah in the fish's belly, appoint another prophet, let him stew in anger. But here's a place where God will not change his mind. The God of the scripture sticks with those God is stuck with. Like Jonah and Israel, like the elder brother in Jesus' parable, like the early church, like the church today, like you and me. Even when we put ourselves in a 40 stretch, God is patient. God sticks with us. Why? Why would God care about a violent city like Nineveh? Why a wayward prophet like Jonah? Why a shaking, often disappointing group of people called the church? Why would God care about you and me? I think when God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, we might find an answer. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. God's mercy is just as broad as he is. And if God loves all, he cares for all. And when we get a little perspective, see how often we can be like the Ninevites, quick to violence and hurting others, like Jonah, quick to divide into camps, quick to despise or avoid those that make us uncomfortable. We can be like that. God loves us and is patient with us. And we should give thanks. We should say sorry. We should cry out to God because God hears us. Paul says this in the letter to the Romans, chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled or made right to God through the death of his Son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God may relent from his anger, may relent from some calamity we deserve when we turn to him, but he will never change his mind about loving you. Never. It took Jonah a walk of three days to get to Nineveh. And Jesus had to walk three days into death after being killed on the cross before he emerged from the tomb. 
So Jesus came all the way from the glories of heaven to bring us a message. Not just to announce our inevitable doom. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, they, they asked him to give a sign of who he was. And he told them that they would see a sign just like everybody else. He says, the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was for three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man, that to Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He says, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The messenger that's calling you today, it's not a flawed, fish-covered fatalist, but it's God in flesh who came to us, got close to us, was killed, took on death himself, and three days later, He emerged alive because this is the length that Christ would go to reach his enemies to rescue you. Regardless of what 40 you find yourselves in, you are loved, you are wanted, you are called, and so is the person next to you, and so is the person you like the least. So for your action step this week, uh, we've been encouraging you to read along with this sermon series. Uh, So you can do that at firsttemple.org slash 40, that's easy. But we're also challenging you to dedicate some time, to dedicate, schedule 40 minutes of prayer this week. And this week as you pray, ask God to reveal to you who your Ninevites might be. And then pray for them. Who might God be calling you to care for, to reach out to, and that's hard, to share with? What would it look like in a world that's so splintered and angry and loud to this community if we were a people that loved like Christ. And maybe this morning, maybe you just want to know who this God is that loves like this. Maybe you just need to turn to God and cry out because he'll hear you, I promise. Do that. And as you pray, when God moves, when God nudges you, go. For we're no different than the Ninevites. We're no different from Jonah. We've all been enemies of God, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for Jonah. And that in his stubbornness, we can relate. Thank you for the Nineveh. And in their sin, we can relate. And thank you that you loved both of them. And that you love us. And that you're calling us to something bigger, something more beautiful. A love that is beyond what we could imagine. That you have called us to be your church in this place. And as scary as that is, we go with your power. A power that could turn a whole city with just five words. A power that could enter the tomb and emerge three days later and invite us to new life through your son. God, may you move through the people of First Temple. And may you move in people's hearts. Anyone here who you've been working on, may you move, may they listen, may they cry out. For you're the God who hears, you're the God who loves. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen.